Hebrews, the 13th chapter. You don't need to go there. I'm just going to be here for a moment. Hebrews, the 13th chapter, and verse 8 says this. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. Amen? Amen. How do we begin to talk about the one true God? I was wrong earlier. That, that song was written by Stephen and Curtis Chapman. Uh, nah, you were right. It's performed by Stephen. I mean, yes, performed by Stephen Curry. Um, it, it takes a lot to awe us anymore. We're like, yeah, we've become desensitized to so much stuff. But there are those moments in time where we are just simply awed by God, by who He is, and by His, His very presence. And I truly believe that mankind is trying to find God, but it's like that song, looking for love in all the wrong places. They're trying to find God, but they can't find Him because they don't know where He dwells. And they're seeking a relationship with God, but they don't know where to find Him. <coughs> and what they just simply can't understand that God is. Let me read what John wrote in looking for trying to describe Jesus into a world that was A, going to reject him and never be at that place where they could embrace him. I mean, we're about to enter into what we call the Easter season. And in the story of the Easter season, one of the things that comes out very clear is that the world rejected him even his own. When he went to the cross, he went alone. And the world still rejects him. But in the first chapter of John, John, John tries to get us to see something. I want to share with you that just John 1.1 1, 1 begins like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That word, Word, there is the Logos of God. The Word was God. In the beginning was the Word. Which is really interesting that John would begin his gospel with that phraseology because Genesis 1 1 begins in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. There's one thing about the Bible that you need to understand. The Bible never attempts to prove God. So don't use the Bible to try to prove God to somebody. The Bible doesn't try to prove God. The Bible assumes that God is. There's no question in the authors of the scriptures who God is. In the beginning, God. In the beginning was the Word. In other words, he said in the beginning there was Jesus. And Jesus was with God and Jesus was God. One of the hardest concepts for people to understand is the concept of the Trinity. It is really difficult to understand. The further you take it out, it becomes more complicated. I, I, I think having a more simplistic view and say, okay, that's who He is. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. How do you explain three entities that are God and yet they are three personalities that function differently? And we can all come up with illustrations, which I, I, I said Wednesday night, I, I love Sandy's and her use of water. 
Water is a solid, water is a liquid, and it is also a gas. But it's still water. I use the illustration of my personality, who I am. I'm Barry the son, Barry the father, and Barry the grandfather. All three of them have different aspects, but it's still the same person. But those illustrations don't fully uh, convey or tell us who God is. And what the church has done and what we've done for such a long time, one of the difficulties that we've had is we've tried to explain God to people. Instead of acknowledge the awesomeness of who he is. Do you believe in God? Yes, I do. Oh, well, sit down here and explain it to me. Okay, let me. Tastes like chicken. I don't know. <laughs> the first time I ever went on a cruise, I wanted to get away from land. I wanted to walk out, and I did. The very first morning, I walked out. And there was nothing but water. And I walked on this side, and then I walked across and walked on that side, and I saw the sun come up. And all you could see was the vastness of water. And I felt so small. That's how we should have an understanding of who God is. That it's so big that we, we're awed by who he is and yet overwhelmed by the very fact that he loves us. I've seen people attempt to rationalize God and I've, I've seen people try to intellectually explain the existence of God and I've done some of that myself, and, I, and the more that I think about it, the more I'm like, <sighs> see, we try to, way too often, we try to attempt to fit God in the paradigm of our life. Mm -hmm. And we can't even figure out our lives, so how in the world are we going to figure out God in our life? Most of the time we, we uh, refuse to think about who we are and where we are and, you know, did you ever think you would be at this place in your life, good or bad? And, and we measure the success of our life by human standards. In the beginning was the Word. See, there is a religion that thinks God created Jesus, but they're wrong. Because they try to use the Bible and changing words to prove that they created God. That Jesus created, God created Jesus. The Word of God clearly says that He was. He always is. In John 10, it says, the Father and I are one. Jesus said, if you've seen the Father, or if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. For the Father and I are one. I go to prepare a place for you. Don't be sad. I'm going to prepare a place for you. That where I am, you're going to be with me. And the two of us are going to be with the Father. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you open the door, I and the Father will come in and we will have dinner with you. It says we'll sup with you, but you know. I'm from the South. We're having dinner. <laughs> Y'all may be having supper. I'm having dinner. Amen? Amen? See? And the Father and I will come down and we'll sit down and we'll fellowship with you. And I will ask the Father, he said to the disciples, I'll ask the Father to send another counselor, a comforter, the Holy Spirit, that you know about. He is with you, but one day he's going to live in you. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came to dwell in mankind. 
the very presence and essence of God dwells within us. And we don't give that a lot of thought. Someone says to you, how are you feeling? And you, you say, well, I'm doing good. I'm, I'm not feeling so good today. And the truth of the matter is, shouldn't our reaction be, God and I are doing good today? We never think about that. I, I don't think about that. I mean, I don't wake up in the morning and go, hey, how you doing today? You're good? Have a good day? What's the day going to bring? I don't know. Let's go find out. Come on, God. God is with us. We should, shouldn't we act like that? I know that sounds crazy, and if you talk to yourself, people will think you're weird, but you are. <laughs> because my word says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. That his very essence is inside of us. And it got there because one day I said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. <laughs> And I do such a poor job of trying to tell him how he ought to run my life and all how we do things. God in you. I mean, if we got zapped every morning, we pay more attention to it. You know, like I mean, if God went, I'm here. Well, okay. Or if you start to tell a fib, or you start to do something wrong, and you win, and God goes, ah, ah, and you go, oh, oh, okay, okay, I won't do that. But God says, I'm dwelling in you, leaving it up to you to bring my glory out. I'm going to leave it up to you. But he's in us. The same God that stands on the outside of time and looks in, the same God that created the heavens and the earth, the same God that is out there is the same God that dwells in here. Amen? Amen. Why don't we live like it? We don't live. We don't need to pray more. We don't need to read God's word anymore. We must. <coughs> Allow him to be in us. We're given instructions. But get God's word to us as much like, let me, let me see how I can put this so you can understand it. Oh, okay, here it is. This is it. Um, you remember when you get, when kids get stuff brought from Santa that requires some assembly? <laughs> you remember those days? <laughs> Men will do this every time. They'll open the box. They'll start taking it out, they'll take it out, they'll take it out. They get to the instructions and they go, I don't need those. <laughs> and then we men will attempt to put it together. Because we know how to do that. And, and then we wind up with 14 pieces left over and figure out. And the wife will say, did you read the instructions? And we'll say, yeah. I, oh, I don't need those. I know what I'm doing. And she's like, yeah, let me see the instructions. <laughs> Watch this. Is there anybody here in this auditorium that can't read? Anybody? So don't tell me you don't need to read. I, mean, I can't understand it. I don't get it. What? You can read it. But how come reading it is not enough? For years we were told to read the Bible, and many of us have read the Bible and studied the Bible, and we poured ourselves into the Bible, and then we come to sin, and we come to conflict, and we decide that we know how to do it better than anybody else. And God inside of us is doing this. Here we go again. And we get to 
it, and we stand on the other side of it, and we're like, God, why can't I learn this? See, I believe we can't learn it because we don't experience Him in the midst of the conflict. We, we don't experience Him before the conflict. Because we try to figure it out before. We, we try to manipulate it. We try to say... Instead of saying, there's a hymn that just came to mind that says, I need thee every hour. How about every minute, every second, every, of being able to be in that experience. Listen to what it goes on to say, because I think this is just incredibly important. Verse 14 says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus became flesh and made His dwelling, His uh, abode with us. And we've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only. And the real translation in there should probably read the one and only begotten. The one true God. And we've seen his glory. You and I have looked through his glory and through past tense, through the filter of our eyes, reading the scriptures. But I can say without question, I have seen His glory in my very presence. You've seen His glory. His glory was here this morning. It's here right now. Forever, wherever two or more are gathered, I'm there in the midst. But we leave doubt of who he is and what he can do and how he does it. Who came from the Father full of grace and truth. <coughs> if you spend any time just, I, I, I get, I absolutely marvel that Jesus could have done a number of things differently. And if he'd have been one of us, he would have. I mean, did Jesus ever have a day where somebody bugged him? <laughs> have you ever thought about that? I mean, from daylight to dark, did he just have some chihuahua nipping at his heels all day long? You know, they can't hurt you, they're just aggravating. Long. The Bible says that he healed all who came to him. That was hundreds of people. Maybe even thousands of people. Can you imagine him just standing all day or sitting on a rock all day going, yep, 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 yep. So let it be, so let it be, so let it be. I mean, he's healing everybody that's coming to him. The very people who will stand in the crowd and say at the top of their lungs, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, are the very people he healed. And here's what's crazy. He healed them knowing that they were going to be the very people who were going to holler them. <clears throat> but you see, he was full of grace and truth. And we're the benefactors of that. Could you imagine if he was like, well, I mean, at some point in the day, I would have gone, okay, that's enough. I'm done. One more person walks 
walks up to me and asks me to heal him, I'm getting rid of him. And, uh, and you have the power to do it. Next, everybody else be like, no, I'm good. No, I'm okay. I'm okay. It's like coaching all these little four-year-olds. I tell the parents, I only have to kill one. You shoot one, the rest of them will behave. He could have done that. When Caiaphas was screaming at him, you come down off the cross and we'll believe you. Wouldn't you have loved to have seen him come off the cross? Wouldn't you love to see him step down and go, excuse me, what'd you say? <laughs> Caiaphas would have been like a bus. Beep, 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 beep. He'd have been backing up. Could you imagine? I wanted him to do that. I want him in one Easter story to come off the cross and look at him and go, excuse me, what? You want to talk to me? Wouldn't you love to see that? Yeah. And I think it, that was a fair. He never got that day. He never got the day. For them to be able to say, but let me tell you something. He's going to have that day. Amen. That day's coming. Just like they crucified him on Friday, what they didn't know was Sunday was coming. His glory was going to be revealed. You know why? Because the Father said so. That's why. The Father said so. Because he told Satan in the garden, you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to touch your head. And that was the first prophecy of Jesus coming into this world. So when people say to me, I believe in God, but I don't believe in Jesus, it breaks my heart. As if somehow Jesus was man-manufactured. <clears throat> but I believe God is. And is very present tense. And Jesus was there. The second part of John first verse, the second part of that says, and he was there creating everything. Jesus was there when it was created. And the Holy Spirit was doing the work. That one part of God. And God said, let it be light. God said, he spoke creation into existence. I love a God like that, amen? I mean, I want I, I don't want to worship a God who has my limitations. <coughs> but yet, so often in the body of Christ, we recreate God to have our limitations. When we say things like, well, God can forgive, but I'm not going to. He's living in you. <laughs> he's, living, he's living in us. I wish sometimes he could grab my throat and stop me. <laughs> Amen? I wish he could be like, Ugh. <laughs> What were you about to say? Barry, what stupid thing were you about to say? What lack of faith thing were you about to speak? Because God spoke, and it was. He spoke. How many things do we speak that hinder our faith? <coughs> How many times have you said, it ain't never going to get any better? We ain't never going to have enough money. And I ain't never going to be healed. How many times have we said that?
instructions. We are missing the relationship. We're missing the intimacy of God. And sometimes that's just nothing more than taking time to talk to him and to get to understand what he wants. John testifying concerning him, he cries out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is surpassed uh, surpasses me because he was before me, John the Baptist. And it says, from the fullness of his grace, he, we have all received one blessing after another. Through God's grace, we've received one blessing after another. Listen to what it says. Listen to this. For the law was given through Moses. All the do's and don'ts. Amen? Amen? Moses gave us all the do's and don'ts we'll ever need. But, Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the only begotten, who is at the Father's side, has made him known to us. The only one that has seen God is Jesus. Jesus said, you see me, you see the Father. And yet, in our world, we hesitate. One of, one of, not the only thing, but one of the few things I like going to hunt camp for. I, I love it when it gets night and I step out of the motorhome and look into the heavens. And it's like, when did they add all those stars? I stood to see a guy one night and looked into the heavens and it was like you could just you've been in places like that where you look to the heavens and you're thinking wow He's amazing, isn't he? And yet, we take him for granted. Sometimes we just sometimes we just we could get on our knees and thank him just for being who he is. Not with a Christmas list of everything we need, because he knows that before we even speak it, amen? That's what makes him who he is. But there are days when we just should probably just, man, just fall down on our face and just say, God, Jesus knew something we don't know. Jesus had been in the very presence of the heart of God. Because he was the heart of God. So as we go through this season, I want you to take some time to take him in, to breathe God in. I think we need to be humbled by our smallness and his bigness. There's a world that wants to know him, 
and we will be better communicators of who he is if we increase our relationship with him as we move further into him I've been reminded lately of what it would be like to lose someone you love. What a world, what would our world be like without him? I can't imagine. I can't imagine approaching one day without him. Even the days I ignore him and I don't have anything to do with him, he's still there. And his word says in Hebrews, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. I am that I am. This morning, just accept him for who he is. Just praise him for who he is. And as we go in this time of decision, let it be a time where we humble ourselves and just simply say, Abba, Father, thank you. Thank you just for being God. My God and my Savior. I do a lot of stuff wrong and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. You're the one true God. If you need to pray, we'll be here. Talk to Him. Just say thank you.